So I've been working on wellbeing for about 10 years now and I'm, a, I'm in a sort of period of reflection as a researcher on, you know, what does it all mean, I suppose. And I think for me it keeps coming back to issues of democracy and power broadly. So whose voices are legitimised when we talk about knowledge on wellbeing, evidence on wellbeing? Whose voices are being disregarded? Whose voices aren't we hearing? Um, and why? And, and so for me, I think the real key is looking very deeply at everyday lives, lots and lots of everyday lives, and understanding them um, and giving space for people to tell their stories and to understand the processes that people are going through and how they, they negotiate their lives. One of the key questions that comes up quite often is at what scale we should be governing well-being. So I think there is a role for governance, there is definitely a role for the state or, or whatever conception of institution you want to imagine that has a role in well-being for populations. At what scale that is, is a difficult question. I mean I've worked at local authority, I've looked at a national scale measure. Um, I think it's really important that it works at the scale that works for people, that works at the scale where people feel power over that measure or that conversation or whatever it is, um, that policy. I think that's that should determine the scale, not a technocratic instrument. I think the scale has to relate to the sorts of empowerment that people feel um, and the control that they have and the way that they can affect change. If we were to look at something like the five ways to well-being, which is a very popular um, distillation of some of the evidence on well-being uh, into a sort of recipe or a, um, a prescription for well-being, so connect with other people, take exercise, keep active, you know, um, keep learning, keep noticing, um, and I think that's been taken up and used by many groups and many individuals and I think that has its place and it certainly has its possibilities to help people. I think the problem is when it's prescribed at a population level as a way to educate people about their own well-being in a very patronising way um, and a way which glosses over uh, some real structural inequalities. So it may be a good message for somebody who's perhaps coping with a terminal illness. It may not be a good message for somebody who's struggling with poverty. And I think we have to be very careful about giving those messages to people and telling them that if they can't change it, change the way they think about it, for example. So I think with the five ways to well-being, we need to be very, very careful what messages we're giving and how we're prescribing what well-being is for certain groups of people and how we're ignoring some other bigger difficulties that they have no control over whatsoever. So I remember talking to one older man um, in Blythe Valley um, about well-being and his conceptions of well-being and what might limit well-being for many people. And uh, I remember him looking at me um, very directly when I asked him that question, what might limit well-being for people? And he looked at me and said, well, it's capitalism pet. You know, it's, it's, it's a great anecdote, but I think, you know, he made a really valid point in the sense that no matter what you think about political economies or forms of political economy, there are bigger things out there that affect well-being and people should have the space to reflect on those and to actually um, negotiate their own values about that. But we don't see that as part of the debate very often, or at least it's not captured in the normal types of instruments that we use to capture well-being. Um, and of course that's very difficult, but I think it's still very valid. The key thing that I would want to say if I was asked to sum up um, what was important in terms of well-being, that is to keep a space open for people to negotiate that on their own terms, 
And what I mean by that is not to prescribe what well-being is, not to prejudge it, not to over scientize it so that only people with a PhD in economics or statistics can enter into a dialogue about it, to keep it democratic, to keep it grassroots. And really the shift needs to be on the part of governments and policy makers and researchers to really endeavour to understand it on that level. And I think we've got a very long way to go.